Great, thank you. And thanks, Amy, and thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm really excited about the webinar today. This will be our second uh, Paddle of the Gulf Citizen Science app training. This today is focused on marine debris apps, so it should be a really great session. I just wanted to go over a little bit of technology with you. First, if you see it, you should be able to see a toolbar up at the top of your screen. That will help you to set up the speakers, and hopefully you guys have that already so that you can hear me loud and clear. Um, the Adobe Connect application is best for the best experience. Um, however, you can if you have to run it from your web browser. Up at the top right, you'll see kind of, you know, like the, the bars, the signal bars that you get on your cell phone. Um, that will help indicate your connection quality. Uh, if you have a slow internet connection, uh, try closing any unnecessary web pages or applications or devices. Uh, pause camera sharing. Um, all of the attendees are joined uh, without the camera sharing, so that should be helpful as well. And if all else fails, unfortunately, close and restart Adobe Connect. You'll miss a little bit, but we are recording it, so you can come back and catch anything that you might miss in that case. A um, little bit of additional webinar info. Please use the chat box for technical issues and for any questions. Uh, we will be monitoring that and we'll be able to help and um, share any questions that you have in there uh, during Q&A session. Uh, as I mentioned, participants will not have camera rights. They will also not have microphone rights. Um, that helps us with any background noise. And as an additional note, the webinar is being recorded. I did mention that as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's being recorded so that if you need it, uh, you can come back to it later and there will also be closed captions in the recorded version. All right, passing it over to Becky. Helps if I unmute. Thank you, Kristen. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Becky Alley. I'm with representing the Paddle of the Gulf initiative today. And Paddle of the Gulf is an organization, a, a network of many organizations, federal, state, local, government organizations, non-governmental organizations, um, industry. This network of organizations is trying to connect people with the coastal streams and rivers that flow into the Gulf of Mexico. And a part of what we want to do with Paddle of the Gulf is to create citizen science opportunities and volunteer opportunities to help people out on the waters find their adventure with a purpose. Today our goal is to have you learn about two different marine debris apps that will be useful for incorporating citizen science into outreach activities. Our first speaker today is going to be Dr. Caitlin Wessel. She is going to speak to us about the marine debris in the Gulf of Mexico. Dr. Wessel is the Gulf of Mexico Regional Coordinator for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Marine Debris Program. She has a broad background in both research and education and has been working on the research, prevention, and removal of marine debris in the Gulf of Mexico for the last nine years and with NOAA since 2016. Caitlin is also the coordinator of the Gulf of Mexico Alliance's Marine Debris Cross-Team Initiative. Caitlin. Thank you, Becky, and thank you, Amy. Um, so I'm going to talk real quickly about marine debris, just a little bit of background about what it is, and then also let you guys know about an opportunity to get involved with marine debris work in the Gulf of Mexico. So hopefully everyone already has some idea of what marine debris is, but it can be defined plainly as any solid man-made material and includes items ranging from consumer products like chip bags and water bottles, all the way up to large things like derelict vessels and fishing gear. Uh, and marine debris touches every part of our oceans. So where does marine debris come from? So this might seem like a very obvious answer to what is a simple question, but it's always important to point out that humans, you and I, are the ultimate source of all marine debris on the planet. Everywhere we've looked for marine debris from the Arctic to deep ocean trenches, we've found it, including here in the Gulf of Mexico. With such a large reach, marine debris can cause numerous problems, 
including entangling wildlife, ingestion and chemical uptake. It can also cause damage to vessels and be a nav navigational hazard. It can transport invasive species from one place to another, result in economic losses due to tourism, continue to ghost fish target and non-target species, and also destroy habitat. The NOAA Marine Debris Program, which is where I work, was established by Congress in 2006 as the federal lead for all things marine debris. And because of that, our program's mission is to investigate and prevent the adverse impacts of marine debris. My role for the program is a regional coordinator. Um, and my job is to better target our work here in the Gulf of Mexico and to help build relationships locally across the Gulf. To effectively work on marine debris issues across the Gulf of Mexico, NOAA and the EPA have teamed up with a group called the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, and they're one of a handful of regional ocean partnerships across the U.S. The Gulf of Mexico Alliance's Marine Debris Cross Team Initiative was first created in 2016, and this past year, despite the pandemic, we worked with marine debris stakeholders and partners across all five of the Gulf states to identify regional marine debris problems and also create our second action plan, which will kick off later this summer. Um, that picture there is actually from our meeting in 2019. We didn't get to meet in person um, this past year. So the goal of the Marine Debris Cross Team Initiative is to assess, reduce, prevent, and eliminate marine debris and litter in the Gulf of Mexico and its watershed to enhance wildlife, fisheries, habitats, water resources, humans, and the Gulf economy. If you are interested in working on the action plan or being part of the Marine Debris Crop Team, you can either email me or sign up on the Gulf of Mexico Alliance website. And with that, I'm going to hand it back off to Becky to introduce our first Marine Debris App presenter. For our next speaker is Catherine Youngblood. She will be talking to us about the Marine Debris Tracker app. Catherine is a research engineer and citizen science director at the University of Georgia. She has extensive experience collecting quantitative and qualitative data for analysis, oversees the Marine Debris Tracker citizen science app, and is currently helping to manage circularity assessment protocol projects in Chile. Mexico, and the Philippines. Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for that introduction. Let me get my screen share set up here. All right. So Marine Debris Tracker is, like, much like Ocean Coast Services Clean Swell app, is an app that is designed to uh, collect geospatial data on litter. Um, the app was originally developed in partnership with NOAA and the University of Georgia back in 2010, so we've been around quite a while. And we're now powered by Morgan Stanley in partnership with National Geographic. So as I was saying, the app is used to collect geospatial data on litter. So every time you log an item with the app, it's creating a unique geospatial data point um, of exactly where that item is, what it is, what time you found it. And that is a really robust, high quality scientific data, that real time live data. And our goal with this is to create this bigger picture of what plastic pollution looks like around the world. And we've made a little bit of progress towards that goal with over 3 million items tracked. We're actually pushing 4 million items tracked, and that's in 90 different countries around the world. So um, a growing and global database of, of plastic pollution. And I wanted to going to jump into the actual what the app looks like and show you guys a screen share of, of what it um, of how it actually works, but I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that we have a lot of resources available on our website, debritracker.org. Um, there's tutorials and guides for how to use the app, as well as you can access all of the data that's collected on the app on our website. But let me jump into this screen share and show you what it actually looks like. So when you open up the app after it loads, 
there's options for tracking with um, different organizations, as well as you can skip to a quick track, which takes you directly to the NOAA list. So we have lots of different lists on the app. These are all um, customized to different tracking needs. So we have some lists like the Ocean Conservancy International Coastal Cleanup list and the NOAA list that are you know, really great general lists that can be used for most contexts. And then we also have lists that are um, that organizations have adapted to their local tracking context. So um, lists that have particular items that are being found in a certain area, lists that are in um, local languages or dialects so that citizen scientists know what the items are um, that people are looking for. But I'll show you guys what the Ocean Conservancy list looks like. So when you click on a list, it has the top trackers. And then you can actually open up the list and it will take you to that list of tracking items. So um, lots of different, this list of litter items, definitely recommend before you actually go out in the field, taking the time to scroll through the list and familiarize yourself with what, um, what is in that list. Um, and once you are ready to track, you can search for items. That is a really quick way to pull up stuff. And then you can also add descriptions. So we have people who use that field to add things like brand data, um, other information. You'll sometimes get a waiting for GPS signal. I was doing a screen recording in my house, so I was getting these waiting for GPS signals more regularly. Um, but you can search for different items. You can change the number and quantity of items. There's also a test item in here, which is basically a, um, a way to just practice with it without submitting real data uh, into the database. So. Once you have uploaded different items, oh, there we go. Once you have uploaded these different items, you can use that manage item tab to review what you've submitted. Um, and then you can also get rid of items that you didn't need to track. So yeah, you can click that little X icon and then delete items that you accidentally logged. And then once you're ready to submit, you just click continue and it will take you to your session overview. Um, you can also add images with associated with that session. So um, if you have you know, pictures of the trash that you've collected, you can include those in there as well. And then you just scroll down and click upload session. So you see there's an option both for upload session and for upload later. So that upload later feature is designed for if you don't have access to Wi-Fi or cell phone signal, you can use that upload later button and go back and upload your session when you do have access to Wi-Fi. But if you are ready to upload and you have good cell service, you can go ahead and click upload session. And then the session will upload the images and then upload the data to our open database. So whichever list you use, it's all going to the same open database. And after you're done, you can also go back to your home screen and review um, the sessions that you have tracked. So this is some data I was collecting for a project and you can see um, the different items that were collected as well as the photos I submitted. So you can go back and review what you've, what you've done there. And then I also wanted to show you guys another feature. So we also have the ability to link to SciStarter, which is a really great citizen science platform. And then we also have the ability to create projects within the app. So this is basically another level of, uh, of um, aggregating data beyond the organization list. So if you don't need a custom tracking list, a custom tracking protocol, but you wanna group all your organization data together, say for a particular cleanup event or for a particular you know, nonprofit, but you're already following a protocol like Ocean Conservancy's ICC list or the NOAA list, um, you can use this project feature to create a project and then have users go in and associate their data with that project. So again, just another layer to be able to um, keep that data, uh, in, to be able to aggregate and isolate that data for particular projects. So um, a couple more notes on getting the app set up. So um, make sure that you allow the app to access your location and also make sure you turn on precise location. So this will, in Android, it's actually called high accuracy mode. So this will give you the best quality GPS, again, for that highest quality accuracy in terms of that point specific data. Also allow the app to access photos if you're going to um, include photos in your log as well. 
So I was, I was talking a little bit about how the app is recording this real-time geospatial data point, and it is a lot more effort to log that data while you're doing a cleanup in the ground on the ground. So um, a couple options for doing that. I, the one that we prefer and that um, we've heard from folks is really the best option is to track in pairs. Um, to have one person collecting data and the other person picking up seems to be the, the best teamwork way to get a lot of data and a lot and, and you know, clean up in an efficient way. Um, we've also had folks say that they go and do uh, recording the data on an entire area and then go back and do the cleanup. Um, but then I also wanted to talk about another option that we have for uploading data, which is the manual upload feature on our website. So this is a, a new feature that we've built pretty recently, but for a lot of organizations, we know it's difficult to kind of track in real time on the ground. Um, so we've added this feature on our database where you can, if the if infrastructure is very similar to the app, you still select a list and then go in and add the number of items and the different items that you're seeing. But this allows you to select a location where you collected that data. So because the app is designed for that real-time location data, um, it will record where you actually are, but this allows you to select, you know, if you did the cleanup in a different place than where you're currently submitting that data from. And again, all of that data is, is in our open uh, access database that's available. So you can search by you can search by different lists, search by different date ranges, look at the different categories of items, and then also all of that data is available for download. So um, we do take all of those lists and uh, cross-reference them together. So there's also a, a download available for all organizations where you can see what data looks like across all of those different lists. And then I just wanted to share a couple case studies of folks who have been using this app. So I mean, that's, our goal is really to support open data collection. So, you know, it's really the people on the ground and all these amazing organizations that we work with who are, are the ones behind a lot of the actual data collection. Um, but I did want to share that, so we used the app in 2019 as part of a National Geographic expedition along the Ganges River in India and Bangladesh. And as part of that expedition, we developed some educational resources for the, for the app. Um, and so you can see these on this URL right here, notgeo.org slash debris tracker. And there is a plastic pollution action journal as well as a guide to the app. And so these are great resources for using the app in an educational setting. And then I'll also mention that right now we have a project going on. Um, the, the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative is an effort to track plastic pollution along the Mississippi River, which is some really important inland data that we're getting um, a lot of the, the focus of plastic pollution data collection is typically on the coast, as you guys are aware. So um, this upstream data, collecting collecting data along the Mississippi, I think will be a really powerful complement to what you guys are doing in the Gulf. And I'll also mention that this month is actually the 10-year anniversary of Debris Tracker. So it launched back in 2011 in April. So our goal this year is to have the most items tracked we've ever tracked. And We've had uh, over 100,000 items submitted already, and we're only halfway through the month. So we're making pretty good progress towards that goal. But we'd love any of you to be part of that as well and to join us in collecting this important data on debris. I think um, you know cleanups by themselves are so important, but collecting the data on what, what is happening and what, and what we're finding is so powerful in terms of being able to turn that, turn that cleanup, turn that data into upstream solutions. So I will stop there and pause for any questions. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I do have some questions for you. Um, first of all, Jen says that this is a very impressive app. Thank you. Congratulations on your anniversary. That's coming from me, not, not Jen. Um, okay, the first question I have for you is from Tasha. The question is, um, I lost it for a second, bear with me. Is, uh, is this strictly a community science or are you planning to integrate other marine debris removal data into the mapping database? Yeah, so we do have um, a variety of, of data sets that are coming in, including we have NOAA has an abandoned and derelict vessels list on the app, so we do have some of that data. 
Um, so there's data kind of coming in from a lot of different places. We don't pull any data that's external to the app um, or to uh, the, the online upload portal into our database. Um, all of our, our data is open and publicly accessible, and there's some other organizations that are doing great work to try to um, integrate data sets across, across different marine debris tracking platforms. So we're not necessarily doing any of that work, um, but we do have people pull in, uh, put in data in the database retroactively. So um, we do have some organizations who are using that manual data upload feature to upload their paper data card. So we're sort of a, a catch-all, I guess, in terms of um, people who want a space to store their data and share it uh, with, you know, with an open data, a publicly accessible open database. Okay, I think you might have answered this next question during your presentation, um, but the question is, once all the data are in, can an organization, is an organization able to download the data collected? Yep, of course. So all, all the data is open data, it's all publicly accessible, and then um, we've been recently building out more support for organizations who have custom lists on the app. So we have, now we have project portals um, where people can go in and access um, data specific to their organization as well. But all the data collected is, is publicly available and accessible. Great. Um, the next question is from Kristen. Can an individual that's not associated with an event or organization enter data, for example, if they go to the beach and pick up some debris on their own? Yep, so we have a quick track feature on the list on the app, so you can skip selecting an organization and use that quick track feature. Um, that actually takes you to the NOAA list, but that's um, the NOAA list is a really great uh, protocol for tracking data pretty much anywhere in the world, especially in a coastal environment. Um, so yeah, that that's the the option that we've created for people who aren't necessarily associated with a particular organization. And that brings me back to another question that I skipped right over accidentally. How does an organization get on the list? Yeah, so you can reach out to us at debristracker101 at gmail.com if you're interested, and we can send you some more information on how to do that. Um, but basically, we support these organizations as long as they're collecting data. So we have some minimum use requirements for how many users um, and how much data you're collecting annually. And then we kind of provide that support for creating those custom lists for free. Um, so it's really just a, a way to get people to share their data in, in this open database. We, we really believe that by um, having everybody collecting data in a in an open data way that we can, um, you know, be creating this information that's really powerful, not just for scientific research, but also for looking at solutions. So um, we're happy to support organizations who are willing to participate in that. Great. The next question is from Sarah. Is there a way to select an area, say coastal counties in South Carolina, and look at all the data that has been entered over the years? Would this be helpful when policymakers ask for data on debris issues? That's a great question. Or this would be helpful. Yeah, so, so we're working on building a geospatial filter right now um, for our database. So this is very much a work in progress. And that's one of the things that's on our to-do list is to build more data filtering capacity into the platform. But currently, you can download um, the, all of the data set, and then you can use Excel or GIS to filter that data. Um, so you have to do some kind of post-processing of it, but we are working on building more of that kind of data filtering ability into our website as well. Excellent. Um, the next question, is there any coordinated crossover with the Paddle the Gulf program? That's a question to both of us, actually. Um, there is not, at the moment, there is no coordinated crossover between the programs. Yep, I would, have any if you guys are interested in collecting data as part of this project, I would recommend um, the NOAA list is a great option for, for coastal data, as is the Ocean Conservancy ICC list. So both of those are um, great options to collect data if you are interested in doing it as part of this project. And, I, and we will be certainly, um, as soon as we're able to start hosting events, hopefully maybe later this summer or in the fall, if we're able to, depending on how the pandemic is going, 
and actually host events and get some people out there doing some coastal cleanups, we will want to track the data for sure. So we will be using this app at that time. Um, that's the only questions I see at the moment. I don't think I've missed anything. Perhaps, uh, Catherine, you could put that address in the chat box that you mentioned for people to contact well, if they're interested in um, getting on the list. Um, get a, real quick, I'm going to go back to Caitlin for a second. I did have a question come in for Caitlin just as you got started, Catherine. So um, to Caitlin, are there productive useful things that someone can do with marine debris besides disposing of it properly? So that's a good question. There are different art forms that you can use marine debris for. Um, and then depending on what type of marine debris it is, there are different creative ways for recycling it. Um, so if you have monofilament, um, there are companies that will take monofilament for recycling. Um, and then there are other groups that have creative ways for recycling things like shampoo bottles or chip bags and candy bags and stuff like that. It really, it's really dependent on what type of debris you're picking up. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Sarah Kolar serves as the Outreach Manager for the International Coastal Cleanup under Ocean Conservancy's Trash-Free Seas Program. She enjoys working with a fantastic network of beach and waterway cleanup organiza organizers worldwide, along with passionate educators and individuals who take action on their issue, on the issue in their own communities. She manages the creation and distribution of education and outreach materials for action-based solutions and maintains Ocean Conservancy's Clean Swell app, an online ocean trash database. She holds a bachelor's degree in biology and environmental studies from Eckert College and has been with Ocean Conservancy for seven years. She's had the pleasure of representing the Trash-Free Seas program at a number of local, state, and national marine debris meetings and conferences. And today, Sarah will be talking to us about the Clean Swell app. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Becky and Kristen and everyone um, involved in this training. And it's really exciting to talk to all of you uh, representing communities taking part in Paddle the Gulf. Um, we're really excited to be involved and um, and follow up after, after Catherine and the Marine Debris Tracker um, app presentation. You will see a lot of similarities. Um, I will say Clean Swell is a little bit newer. Um, it was established in 2016, and we really did coordinate with Dr. Jembeck and her lab and her team um, in helping us create this app um, really specific to the international coastal cleanup and the, the list of marine debris data that, that our volunteers have tracked throughout the 35-year history of the ICC. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, just some quick kind of high level uh, notes right, right off the bat as we get a lot of questions about this. Um, both of the apps actually are, you know, you can download them. They're completely free on iOS and Android devices. Um, you know, we recommend downloading it in advance before you head out into the field um, because just like any other app, you do need to have Wi-Fi in order to download. Um, and we get this question a lot at Ocean Conservancy about Clean Swell. Um, yes, the app was built as an international coastal cleanup tool, but as we're, you know, discussing here, this is really a tool that we want folks to feel empowered to use year-round for any cleanup anywhere, inland or on the coast, um, you know, a big event or just the cleanup of one. Um, and I'll walk through, um, I only have a couple of slides here actually, and then I'll walk through a demonstration of the app, just step-by-step -step, um, with, with the most of, of my time. So, um, you know, I think a number of presenters already mentioned this, touched on this. We don't just collect the data just to have the data. So I just want to start off right away and say that the data are used. And whenever I'm speaking to volunteers out at a cleanup and we're talking about data collection and we're offering this as an option, we always mention how um, the, the data are open access. They go into online open access database. Our data goes into um, 
a system that we call Tides, um, but it does kind of marry nicely with other um, data sets. And um, as Catherine just mentioned, we're able to actually download the International Coastal Cleanup data from Marine Debris uh, Tracker's site and actually have those kind of blend into our system as well. So there's a lot of wonderful collaboration going on in the space. And the open data set is fantastic and really referenced daily by scientists, policymakers, industry innovators, really anyone that's looking to, to solve this massive global issue. Um, we love hearing from students who download the data sets and use these real world data for um, a lot of their projects. So here on the slide, just a couple examples of policies that have been implemented um, using international coastal cleanup and clean swell collected data by volunteers um, and volunteer events, big and small. So a couple of screenshots first, because once I dive in, um, you'll see I'm already logged in. So I want to show you some of the initial things that you'd see first time downloading the app. Um, just like Marine Debris Tracker, CleanSwell works best if you allow location services to be turned on. So that's a question that you get right away when you download the app for the first time. Make sure you click allow while using the app. Um, we also have some frequently asked question kind of pages and documents, guidance uh, tools that I'm happy to send along as a follow up here. And, and there's some instructions there about, you know, if you already have the app downloaded, but you need to check and you have an Android or an iOS device, you know, how can I get to that? How can I check to make sure I have location services turned on? Um, and this is just to optimize the functionality. Um, very similar to Tracker, CleanSwell utilizes that internal GPS so that the user um, you know, it's just one last thing that the user has to do in inputting their location because we'll know right away. Um, once they submit their data, we'll know where they clean. Um, it also helps track the distance covered too. Um, that's a metric that we tend to use a lot with the international coastal cleanup is, you know, the number of volunteers in an event, um, the total weight of debris collected, and then uh, the distance covered. And as I made note there, um, once you create an account one time, you just remain logged in. Um, but you can have, you know, the same account on multiple devices and you can switch um, accounts on the same device. A lot of groups, a lot of um, teaching, you know, student groups will use the app on tablets, for instance. A little bit bigger screen. Oh, yeah, there's an example. A little bit bigger screen for um, the youngsters that like using the app. Um, and there are uh, a, a number of languages that CleanSwell is available in. This, you know, international coastal cleanup, we have partners in about 150, 160 countries at the, at the moment. Um, so we're working all the time to keep the translations coming. I think we're at seven languages right now. So that's what's in the profile there on the app. Um, and very similar to Tracker, we encourage folks to do this in small groups, right? And, you know, not everyone's going to want to have their smart device or smartphone out on the river, on the beach while doing a cleanup. And that's great. In fact, Using about groups of three or four is usually what we recommend and have just one person be that designated data recorder and they can follow along, um, listen to what their teammates are calling out and collect data as you go. Uh, we definitely recommend that route. We have had partners do the whole collect it all, dump it out on a tarp, do the sorting and, and plug in the numbers after the fact. And you can definitely do that with CleanSwell. Um, we just love, you know, and the app was kind of built with that idea in mind that you're really kind of walking along and you're tracking your debris as you go. And then you're only touching the trash once um, and it goes right into a bucket in a bag and it doesn't have to be, you know, risk blowing away again. Um, I think it's my last slide before I'll dive into the demo, but there are a couple of features that I'll be sure to point out. One of those is group. Um, and in one of the questions, you know, someone had mentioned, like, how can we kind of integrate this with Paddle to Golf? This is where you can do that for the Clean Swell app. So if you do choose to use this app, um, there is a group feature that you'll see that's a little field on a couple of screens of Clean Swell because it is really important. And it allows you to have your individual effort uh, connect to a larger group effort. And um, what that does when you submit your data on the back end database, you can go in, filter by date. You can zoom into state, county, whatever level you want. And there's a group field too, so you can just simply type in, you know, whatever that, that decided group name was, filter for that, and then you'll be able to just download reports um, just from, from that group identif identifier or um, tagline, whatever it might be. So I will get to that now. Yep, I think that's my last slide. So I'm going to go ahead and just transition really quickly here and try to share my screen.
Thank you. I'm going to set up. All right, hopefully you don't see my messy desktop and you can see uh, my, my phone screen now. Um, so this is what CleanSwell looks like. When you first open up the app, it might look slightly different if you're an Android user. I'll say I'm working on an iPhone now. So things like this dark gray, like black navigation bar at the bottom, for Android users, I believe that's at the top. But really, you know, everything functions the same. Um, all the same features here just might look slightly different. Um, under that profile here, this is where you see I've got my profile set. Uh, you, if you scroll down a little bit, this is where your uh, language option is. And then you can update anything. I'm going to go back and click on Home in the bottom left corner and just dive into two quick um, examples of collection routes. So uh, the typical collection just starts with Start Collecting. And before you begin, this is a screen that just asks for some really initial um, information about your event. So how many people you're working with, right? Like not just the data recorder, but how many people are in your group total. And then here you see this group name. And as I tap on these with my finger, this is kind of how the text field is highlighted. So this is where you could put something like PTG for Paddle to Golf. And it's not case sensitive, so it doesn't matter if capitalization <laughs> happens with some and not others, you know, whatever you want to do there. Um, sometimes if there's like a team scenario where there's a friendly competition, that's where you can kind of do different teams. Um, and really that's just decided upon for you. You don't have to register a group or anything like that with Ocean Conservancy. You decide and then it just it shows in the backend database as an extra tag there. Type of cleanup, this might actually be um, relevant for this effort in that um, if you are doing any watercraft cleanups, you can indicate that. Um, but the majority of our volunteers are usually doing cleanups on foot. Then you'll click Start My Collection. And this is the, the bulk of the app. This is really um, kind of the screen that a volunteer or user would spend the most time on. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you're walking along with your group and folks can call out, say, three food wrappers. And the data recorder just taps on that icon as they go. So, you know, the goal here was just to be very simple, um, straightforward, icon heavy um, for, for youth to kind of, you know, have it be accessible as well. Um, and then with our list, we do have um, just our specific categories that we've tracked over time. Um, but there are always going to be items that you find that aren't listed. For us, we have this other trash icon in the bottom right corner that you can use for that. Um, but we've been trying to kind of keep with the times and add uh, different categories, uh, just being mindful of our historic data set as well. I um, mean, we put some of those really common categories up towards the top, and we really do focus on the single-use plastic items and some of the items that really do have a strong um, potential for policy play. Um, one other feature that I want to note here is if you find a lot of a particular item, for instance, plastic and foam pieces there on the left-hand side of the screen, what I just did, I actually held down like my fingertip on that icon for a few extra seconds. And then this window comes up and this is where I can put something um, like 400, right? Like a bulk addition to my tally so that I don't have to be sitting here, you know, tapping this icon 400 times. Um, so that's kind of the bulk add feature. Um, you know, we need to find better names for this, but you get the point. Um, I'll do another example with cigarette butts, which is another really common like high quantity count item. Maybe you have a team that's really only looking for cigarette butts on, on their cleanup, and then you can add um, bulk quantities there, and it just keeps going with your running tally. And of course, if you need to remove an item, that toggles down here at the bottom. If you kind of accidentally hit an icon, and you'll see um, they change color, so it really makes it um, obvious that you're actually now subtracting from your total when you click on the icon. And then you can just toggle back when you want to switch back into addition mode. Um, I'm not going to go to it because you probably don't want to see the inside of my apartment, but in the top right corner is a camera icon, and this allows you to capture anything about your cleanup event, um, celebratory group photo, the inside of your, you know, what the contents of your bucket or your bag, any strange or weird finds, um, and you can share those privately with Ocean Conservancy. We have a, a, a private Flickr account or um, you can share them on social media, and they should also save to your phone's camera roll. 
And once we get down here uh, towards the bottom, say we're, we're stealing set with our cleanup, you'll see group name is also there. So there are a lot of opportunities to adjust this if you need to change anything. Um, and then when you feel set, just click Done Collecting. Pretty straightforward there. You can adjust any of these fields here at the top of the Review Your Cleanup screen. This is just the one last screen that you need to get through before your data officially submits. Uh, we get this question all the time about the weight. Um, what we've done is we've actually pre-calculated the weight using um, default weights for all the items that you just saw on the last screen, on the collection screen. So we have a dry mass for each of those items. But that's not always going to be accurate, right? Because we have that other trash category that, you know, you could have picked up an appliance, right? Like a television set. And, and that wouldn't be included in, in the app's calculation. So you can always override what's in this field here and correct it if you say at your cleanup you're able to get an, an exact weight using a scale um, or a fish hook scale, something like that. So don't feel like you have to have use the weight that's there. We just know that a lot of individual users are not going to have a scale with them. So we want to make sure we at least get an estimate of the weight that they have collected. The comments field is just to know anything you want about your cleanup, um, items of local concern, any wildlife that you might have come across entangled, um, really anything you want there. A lot of folks like to put weird finds there as well. And then again, this is that initial information that just for you to review one last time, make sure if you want to be tagged as part of a larger group that you've got that group name in there, and then you go ahead and click Submit My Data. Um, the data will submit if you are outside of cellular service. So we do get that question a lot. What will happen if you're out of cellular range, a different window will pop up and it will say, we've got your data, we're storing them, and once you get back into range, then your data will go off into Ocean Conservancy's online database. So a little bit of a different step there, but um, you can use the app without any service at all. In fact, a lot of users will put their phone in um, like airplane mode to kind of help save the battery there while they're using it. Once you get to this thank you screen, that's when you know your data has submitted to the online database um, where you can then go capture them and, and pull any other reports that you need. Um, and you can share your successes on social media. That's what that big button there is. Um, but I'm also just going to go down to, I want to show you the My Cleanup history in the middle there. This is how you can track your individual impact across all of your cleanups over time. Um, so you can, any of these little plus minuses are just little open like menus that you can open up. So I can see, say, over time, how many plastic straws have I collected in total? Um, so you kind of have your running stats there. Really fun, a way to kind of engage and to keep individuals, you know, coming back to the app. And, and that's what these are all about. So these badges are just really fun, different levels that you can earn. The more you clean, the more you earn. We create special badges for different events. Um, I think if I scroll down here, yep, we've got, you know, each year with the International Coastal Cleanup, we like to have a different um, animal that we focus on. Um, and so if you kind of log in and do a cleanup during that time of the year, you earn that badge um, and so on and so forth. So um, that's all under cleanup history. I'm going to go back to the home screen, and I think I have a little bit more time, to, um, so if time permits, I'm just going to show really quickly a new feature that um, we really implemented um, due to this pandemic that we're all in now, and, and the fact that um, it might not be possible for us to have our phones out with us, uh, or we might not want to have our phones out with us during a cleanup at this time, and especially if you're a cleanup of one, it's really hard to juggle all of that. Um, and Volunteers who are touching debris should very, uh, very much wear <laughs> protective equipment, right? So gloves, um, P all PPE. And so if you're wearing gloves, it's not going to be as feasible to, to record your data as you go. So this is what the record a past cleanup is for. And this is, you know, this very simple one screen, you fill in the same details. Um, if you've got location services on, it'll show there. If you need to plug in where your cleanup took place, you just click, yep, my cleanup took place somewhere else. Um, you kind of search similar to uh, like a Google Maps search. And when I click find, an option will come up and then, you know, I can search for a city, a landmark, whatever I want that is, you know, the closest spot to where my cleanup actually took place. Um, and then instead of doing the item by item count data, since you won't be able to remember that if, if you did this cleanup, you know, say a couple hours ago and you're just going back to record your summary. All we ask for here is just how many bags did you fill and what size of bag? Um, so you go ahead and mark those. There's weight estimates there as well in case you do happen to know the total weight 
of debris collected. You can also override any of the icon um, information if you really know the exact pounds collected. And then you just go ahead and submit my data again, and you get back to this thank you screen. So two different routes, one a little bit longer, more detailed. We love that item by item data. Um, that's what really kind of helps drive the science and the policy. But we know that um, just getting sheer impact of people and weight collected is also wonderful. And that's what that record a past cleanup feature is all about. So I think that wraps up my demo. I will stop sharing now. And I think um, hopefully there's uh, a couple of questions and we can um, and I'm happy to share my contact information. I think I had on that first slide there, but happy to share that in the chat as well if anyone has any follow-up questions. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I do have some questions for you. The first question from Kristen has, have schools used clean swell as part of STEM education efforts? Absolutely. Um, we don't have a structured uh, system in place, but we, we know, we talk to educators all the time, formal and informal, who have picked up on the app and really enjoyed using it. Um, and that's why we, we really made sure that when we were building it out that it was usable on a number of different screen sizes and really simple for youth to pick up on. Um, we haven't quite get, get, like yet gotten to uh, building out STEM curriculum around the app, but we're, we're looking towards that in the future. I'm excited about that possibility. Great. And the next question from Jen, who happens to be an Eckerd alum. Um, the, do the data to either of the apps go in the same database? If not, if we find debris, should we send them to both apps? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, Catherine and I have been talking about this a lot recently. Our two teams work really closely together. Um, so right now, the, the databases don't automatically read together. Um, but what, what I can do is I can pull the International Coastal Cleanup list from debristracker.org and pull it and get it into our data set. So um, to avoid like duplication, if you've already submitted your data on, on Debris Tracker and it's the kind of the International Coastal Cleanup uh, categories, you can assume that we'll eventually get those data into our system as well. Um, so I would, I would say probably don't want to burden yourself or your volunteers with using both apps and just choose whichever one works best for you. Um, we also often share our full downloads with other organizations, other groups that are building out like the, these mega platforms that um, would ha house all of those data. Um, but we, like Debris Tracker, um, are mainly involved with just taking data in whatever format comes our way and making it fit into our system and making it work for, for our reporting methods. So hopefully that helps answer that question a bit. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, you've already addressed this next question, but it was uh, entered while you, before you got to it, I think. Um, can you go back in and add an event after the fact, cleanups like done back in March, and that would be that past collection feature? Yep, absolutely. You just adjust the date to whenever your cleanup took place. Um, but on that note, we often get the question about, can I go back into my past entries and edit or update those? And that's something that we can't yet do on CleanSwell. Right now, the data feed directly into the database, and it's kind of a one-way street. So um, if you need to have any entry that's already been submitted, edited, uh, we have kind of an admin email that you can reach out to um, and let us know. And then we actually go in on like the website of the database and can adjust any entries or delete maybe an accidental or a test entry, something like that. Um, we're, we're always, we're vetting that database daily to kind of weed out any of those and, and make sure that the data are as accurate as possible. Great, and that question was from Alma, and she mentions that they have data recorded from past cleanups that they record on voice recorders and then transcribe into a data sheet. So Alma, I think you've just created some work for yourself. You can go add all this into the database now. Um, for Sarah and Catherine from Kristen, if a group is doing a bike trail or a roadside cleanup in a coastal area, is that useful? Two are mainly focused, or are you mainly focused on immediately adjacent to water cleanups? 
Well, and Catherine answered that perfectly. I mean, I think we would both say any cleanup anywhere is a good thing, and any data collection at all is great. So any data <laughs> um, that you want to collect is wonderful. We all know that trash travels, and wherever you are inland, it's going to make its way um, down storm drain system, down a watershed, and could very easily end up in the water. So for us, marine debris is really just any debris that's, <laughs> that's out there in the environment and needs to be removed. Hopefully that helps. I agree. That's a great answer. Um, any debris cleaned up is, is helping. Um, and Alma also mentions, thanks to Paddle the Gulf for the awesome marine debris bag. So that brings up a, a point I wanted to make for everybody that's on the call is that Paddle the Gulf does have, um, we have these mesh recyclable marine debris cleanup bags. And um, I have lots of them still available. So if anybody's interested in having some of those bags, if you have a, an event coming up or you want to scare, share with some school kids, just get in touch with me. I'll put my email in the chat box real quick. Just drop me an email and I'll be happy to share bags with you. I can ship those to wherever you need them shipped to. So. Oh, I think I just sent my. There it goes. OK. That's all the questions that I have. Anybody else have any questions? Chris says she can't wait to try the apps. Myself as well. I'll be looking forward to trying these apps out when we are able to get out there and host some events for Paddle the Gulf. Um, I think that's all I have. Kristen, were you going to wrap us up? Yep. Thank you so much. And Sarah and Catherine and Caitlin, thank you very much for presenting. This was a really interesting and very informative webinar. Really appreciate it. Um, if everybody will look at their screens, you should see a closing poll question asking, how much did this training increase your understanding of how to use the marine debris apps? If you would, please select a radio button so that we can all see it and all know how it has helped increase your knowledge. Um, you can also, there's also a um, poll question there that you can enter your email address if you would like to be added to the Paddle of the Gulf distribution list. Uh, that's useful for announcements about upcoming events and trainings, for example. Um, also wanted to let you know that, um, as we mentioned before, this is being recorded. We're going to get it captioned and post it, and we will share a link after the captions are available and have been added. Um, so once again, you know, on behalf of, of you know, Amy and Becky and Caitlin and Catherine and Sarah and myself, um, and on behalf of Paddle the Golf in general, thank you so much to our presenters and to all the attendees. Really appreciate you joining this afternoon. <laughs>